What a beautiful day to be gathered here to discuss these world-changing ideas. It has been my great pleasure to get to know the second year students as they work through some of their research opportunities and I couldn't be more thrilled at being able to hear about their research and work with people who are true change makers in every sense of the word. So I'm not going to take too much time up here myself except to introduce you to four of our students today and you'll see another four next week. We're going to start with Bolu Adewale. Her research asked the question of why FGM is a continued practice. Now there has been a lot of research done on female genital mutilation or FGM. And the research is about whether, you know, how it's a wrong procedure and reasons why it should be banned. Most research has stemmed though from the female perspective thus far and the effects it has on the female reproductive system, self-esteem, mental and physical health. Bolu's project focuses on bridging the gaps between female genital mutilation and social norms, exploring why it is a continued practice and actually looking at another side of this issue, looking at the male side of the issue and bringing a true interdisciplinary inquiry to this study. She's going to look at the male's position in the decision making around this practice within the Somali Toronto community. So Bolu, welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bolu, and I am going to be discussing my research project with you. And uh, the title here is No Longer Silent, Exploring Narratives of FGM with Somali Men in Toronto. So what I'm going to be outlining is what the social problem is, um, why it's important. I'm going to go over my research question and some sub-questions, as well as the theoretical framework, the methodologies, and then my goals and hopes. So what is, sorry, what is FGM? So FGM stands for female genital mutilation and it is the partial or the total removal of the female genitalia. And there's actually four different categories of it that come from type one, type two, type three, type four. So they scale from extreme to extremely extreme. And um, <laughs> it's the only really way to categorize it to be honest. <laughs> Um, and FGM has been um, reported to occur in like predominantly Africa, but it does happen in some other regions and some South um, Asian and some Asian countries as well, as well as like some Ara Ar uh, Arabian nations as well. And the predominantly they focus in the Muslim states. So even in some countries in Africa that may be predominantly Christian, you will find that if you look into the communities that are executing um, FG FGM, that it's mostly in these uh, Muslim areas. And the World Health Organization has actually said that between 100 and 140 million women and children, girls, have undergone this um, procedure. So why should I research FGM? Well, it's carried out, like I said, on a lot of young girls, um, ranging from the age from zero months to anywhere from their elementary school age to teenager age. A lot of times it is done before they hit their, they get their first period. So before puberty even starts, a lot of these women, or sorry, a lot of these children have undergone FGM. Um, it uh, explores the inequality between the sexes and the extreme form of discrimination against women as well. And it also violates women's health, their health and the security and physical integrity of um, women's rights. It also um, poses physical and mental health and uh, the risk uh, to women and young girls. Um, when I was working in Nigeria, I actually met a group of women that were speaking in my dialect and they were actually talking about the effects it had on them. So out of curiosity, I was asking them that, oh, you know, how come nothing is being done about this? There's so many people that are going through this, according to them, and nothing is being done about it. They said, well, you know, Nigeria's facing so many issues right now that that's not one of the issues that they're focusing on right now. So with all the politics and really the only way to get involved and make a change is if you have a PhD in the area or, you know, in research in that specific area or if you're in politics. So that just, that was one of the things that made me say, okay, this is something that really needs to be tackled and addressed. And 
here, it's, I thought this was very interesting from the Women Health Organization. It says, babies born to women who have undergone female genital mutilation suffer a higher rate of neonatal death compared to babies born to women who have not undergone this procedure. So here we see that it's even affecting the unborn as well. So it is an issue that uh, it's affecting women and it's affecting their unborn children as well. Here is a map of Africa, just to give you a visual representation of where FMG is more prevalent. So if you can see the scale there, it says 90 to 99, that's like the chocolate brown area, is where it's most prevalent. And if you see in this corner, Somalia actually has the highest at 98%. And in Toronto, there is a huge Somali community in the Toronto Dixon area, so that's why I'm deciding to focus on that group of, um, for, for my research. This is my research question. What roles do social norms changes play in the ongoing practice of FGM amongst the men in the Toronto Somali community? These are some of the sub-questions. How does gender play a role in the decision-making of FGM? How do young people, Canadian-born Somalis, view the practice of FGM? Has the view shifted from past generations? What roles do Somali community leaders play in, the, in terms of continuing slash discontinuing the practice of FGM within the community? And lastly, how can human rights slash education contribute to changes in attitudes and behaviors towards FGM? The theoretical framework I'm looking at is actual trans theoretical model. So it talks about the five stages of change. If we want change to occur, the different five stages that need to, it's kind of like a wheel that it has to go through. Um, and it focuses on the decision making of the individual. And because I'm actually trying to see the male perspective and where they stand in terms of decision making for FGM, this is why I felt like this was the best fit model that would help uh, to give a visual of the stages. See, one starts at pre-contemplation, it gets into contemplation, then we get into prepare, preparation, which is the planning of change, the action, adopting new habits, and the fifth one is the maintenance, so the ongoing practice of new healthier behavior. So hopefully this model will help me and um, when I get my results together where it lands, maybe it might land on phase three or maybe part two, but this is kind of the scale I'll be looking at to evaluate and go through my research. Methodologies, I'm looking at mixed methods. So from qualitative research, I'm looking at narrative approach, ethnography, focus groups, interviews, and case studies. In terms of quantitative research, I'm looking at questionnaires and surveys. My goals and hopes. Well, I really want to contribute to academia, but apart from that, I want other health organizations and advocates to also know about what I'm doing and maybe some of the research that I got from there, maybe they can pull it to add to what they're doing. Um, I want to influence behavior and social cultural norms, and I want this to reach a larger group through multimedia. I do believe this is a... Um, I, I, we're all gonna do papers, but at the end of the day, I want this to kind of reach a wide range of people. This is an issue that affects a lot of people. And I think if it is well done, it can be very powerful and influence change, even if it's just to get people discussing and bringing the topic back, because it is very important and vital. And thank you for listening. <laughs> From the global to the local. Next, we have Kelly Frankson. Her dissertation is currently enabling frontline leaders to facilitate an environment that promotes psychological health and safety. And now, as intuitive as creating health, healthy workplaces seems, Kelly tells us that many organizations struggle to include um, uh, or to improve employees' psychological health and safety. And since contextual factors vary from one workplace to the next, healthy work practices can be hard to replicate. There's no one size fits all model. Literature describes many factors for successful workplace health promotion, but often results are sourced from evaluations of wellness programs. Less well understood are the features of organizations that contribute to employee health. The literature also reveals a critical role that frontline leaders can play in enabling organizational change efforts. But the frontline leader's role tends to relate to uh, improving uh, psychological health and safety. That's not been examined yet. So Kelly's dissertation is going to review the literature defining healthy workplaces, going to present leading theories to improve workplace health, and going to explore how frontline workers at Vancouver Coastal Health can facilitate an environment that promotes psychological health and safety for their employees and themselves.
So as Jagers mentioned, I'm looking at this idea of enabling frontline leaders to facilitate an environment that promotes psychological health and safety. The words you see on the screen here are just a few of the words that employees at one unit at Vancouver Coastal Health use to describe their work environment. And unfortunately, it is not an isolated incident, and you're starting to see this again and again across healthcare. Um, the environment right now would not be considered healthy. You're seeing sick time go up, turnover go up, leaves go up. But even more so than some of those harder metrics, it's some of the softer metrics, like the toll it plays on relationships, uh, the things that can't be measured, um, that are even more concerning about the issue that's, uh, the issue that's happening. Now, there's a quote here from Graham Lowe, um, who looks at this idea that the question for management is not whether to introduce a wellness program, but how to design, implement, and evaluate it to achieve the best outcomes regarding improved employee well-being, reduce health benefit costs, and improved productivity. A couple interesting things with this quote. One, that just that idea of the question for management. And in a minute, I'll come back to why that idea of the question for management is important. Even looking at Vancouver Coastal Health right now, there's a number of initiatives underway. A number of departments are helping employees in some shape or form, but it's centralized organization-wide initiatives. And results on a unit-by-unit -unit level aren't necessarily improving at this point. In uh, 2016, uh, uh, collective bargaining associations, the Nurses Bargaining Association asked all health authorities across BC to take a formal stance on psychological health and safety and implement the national standard which was developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Now the, mental, uh, the national standard, it came up with 13 factors through an extensive grounded research approach that influence psychological health and safety um, with, within an organization. And those are the 13 factors that you see on the screen there. The national standard does come with recommendations from a more organization-wide systemic policy perspective as to how you can influence these factors. But it's not a one-size-fits-all model. And what works in one area isn't going to necessarily be directly transferred to another area. If we take these 13 factors and we look at where there's a significant amount of literature right now, uh, seven of the factors actually relate to the idea of corporate culture and are influenced by corporate culture. Six of the factors relate to the idea of work structure and are influenced by different uh, factors there. There's an emerging body of research looking at this idea of corporate culture changing in corporate culture, what a co corporate culture for a healthy workplace actually looks like. There's also an emerging body of research looking at this idea of work structures and how you can change work structures to help promote um, healthy workplaces. And despite this, though, you're still seeing environments like those initial quotes reflect. And another way of looking at this and where there's gaps in the literature, there is a significant body of literature looking at this idea of health promotion programs. But again, results are reported on the program level. There is also a significant body of literature looking at the role organizational leaders play in change initiatives and in particular culture initiatives and culture change initiatives. However, their role specifically related to psychological health and safety and in particular the psychological health and safety of employees within their units has not yet been analyzed in, in detail. I should mention the national standard from the Mental Health uh, Commission of Canada just came out in 2013. Um, so a number of organizations are using it across Canada, but even the research about organizations using it right now is at the organization-wide level and at a much higher level than what I want to get into. So this here is actually the gap that I want to be able to fill um, with my research. So within my research, I want to focus on the idea of how can the clinical managers at Vancouver Coastal Health facilitate an environment that promotes psychological health and safety for the employees. In order to do this, I want to use uh, interpretive phenomenological analysis within an action research framework. So the first phase of my research will be doing interviews with clinical managers at, at Vancouver Coastal Health to really learn from them and get their perspective 
as to both what role they play in, uh, in a healthy workplace, as well as the barriers that they actually face within their areas. Even you look at the case study reviews of the national standard, a lot of interviews with employees, a lot of interviews with corporate executives, but that, that middle level has been relatively ignored. So I want to be able to bring their voice forward and really learn from that. Um, one of the things I like about interpretive phenomenological analysis is not only does it allow me to bring the voice of these clinical managers forward, it also allows the researcher to add their own interpretations and reflections throughout this process. I've been working with Vancouver Coastal Health uh, and working with managers at Vancouver Coastal Health for the last eight years and been able to see a lot of the context and the struggles that they're working with. Coming from outside of healthcare initially, I can also recognize a lot of the things that they're kind of taken as a given. In particular, you know, they have this intense desire to deliver the best care possible to patients. Um, that they don't notice some of the other things that um, somebody from outside could actually question. I also sit on the provincial committee for psychological health and safety and kind of bring that, that knowledge to the table. From this piece, I hope it will help inform an action research piece. Well, I'll actually work with one of the clinical managers at Vancouver Coastal Health to co-develop a way to actually improve the psychological, uh, uh, facilitate an environment that promotes psychological health and safety within their specific units. One of the interesting things with this is this idea that I can't, nor would I want to, walk into an area and tell a manager how to run her unit. But what I can do is present information in a way that they can gain some insights, ask questions in a way that, that can lead them in a direction that can help, pro, uh, help them progress and get where, where they need to be. It's part of this action research component as well. There will be a culture pulse check survey that's used. It's an externally developed survey intended to assess the 13 factors uh, for psychological health and safety from the national standard. This will both act as a nice baseline measure to get an idea of where there may be gaps in that particular unit and starting points for investigation, as well as act as a nice pre-post measure after we've worked with the manager and it, it led to some real results in the area um, to, to, to be able to confirm and identify where else you know, the next steps need, may need to be. Looking at the anticipated outcomes of this work, the interpreted phenomenological analysis piece We'll have a standalone element, and I do think there's a lot of learnings that can be gained from that and shared just by bringing these perspectives forward that right now have been relatively ignored. I personally also hope to use that as base information as I move into the action research phase and see what elements, you know, um, fitting and can be, can be addressed there. Within the action research phase, the area that I'm working with will ideally see an improved uh, environment that can facilitate psychological health and safety. And although you won't be able to take what's done in that one unit and directly transfer it to another organization or even another unit within Vancouver Coastal Health, what I hope to be able to do is capture lessons learned and present them in a way that other units and other organizations can still learn from and have more of an approach as opposed to, you know, a structure you know, that, that, they, uh, that they attempt to follow. To close my presentation, I just want to leave you with a quote here from uh, Van Manen that looks at this idea, the aim is not to create technical intellectual tools or perspective models for telling us what to do or how to do something. Rather, a phenomenology of, of practice aims to open up possibilities for creating formative relations between being and acting, between who we are and how we act between thoughtfulness and tact. And that is my presentation for today. Now, of course, good health comes in many forms. And part of that is the care that we get, which Kelly's project spoke to. But part of that has to do with things like clean air and water. And that second part is what this next presentation will speak to. So we're going to look at Nelson Jatel, and his uh, dissertation is on Water Governance Network's Influence on Water Ecological Systems Over Time, a case study based in the Okanagan. Now, Nelson's abstract reads, an old African proverb states, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
If so, by extension, if going together provides long-term advantages for social ecological systems, how important is collaboration in supporting long-term water quality in a watershed? Water ecological systems are influenced by a number of variables, including population growth, increased climate variability, and governance networks. So a truly interdisciplinary problem there. Water governance networks are an expression of formal and informal relationships, rules, and institutions, and may play a meaningful role in water ecological system outcomes. During the late 1960s, water quality was degrading, and as a result, a new water governance network system emerged in the Okanagan. Now, often there is a lag between social choices and economical impacts. So this research focuses on a case study of the Okanagan watershed and explores the influences of governance networks and water quality changes over time. Truly uh, an innovative piece of research. Nelson, come join us. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my talk is largely going to be about social ecological systems and ultimately how is it that we can gain insights into the, the network and the framework that we all contribute to and how does that translate into, in this case, water quality. This is a picture of uh, the north arm of Okanagan Lake circa 1974, 1975. And what's so interesting about this picture is that this drove an entire generation of people that were concerned about degrading water quality in the Okanagan. Um, this is largely driven by increased phosphate, and that's largely driven by um, more people coming into the valley in this case, and uh, specifically unconsolidated septic fields. One of the reasons why phosphorus is such a great analyte for us to be able to use in terms of identifying what's going on with the aquatic ecosystem is that as you go from low concentrations to high concentrations, the water quality degrades quickly with low concentrations of phosphorus. So it allows for us to be able to understand what's going on within the environment without a really significant amount uh, of change in terms of total phosphate. So it's, it's a good means for us to be able to better understand what's going on around us. The global context is that in some areas of the world we have eutrophic or um, high nutrient levels in our water systems, which you see here in, in the dark reds. In other areas around the planet we have effectively oligotrophic or nutrient poor systems and oftentimes that's why we have to add fertilizers to our systems. We find that this problem of eutrophic waters or, or high nutrient waters is something that challenges regions around the world. And what I'm interested in is this interface between specifically the networks and the network characteristics of us as managers and how is it that those things that we do in the management and the governance realm relate to the ecosystem specifically. So here are two voices from the literature that I think are important. Stein and his team suggest that any transformation towards more sustainable and equitable water use and management will need to work through the complex web of social relations. Rob DeLow, a Canadian researcher, notes that identifying actors, clarifying their roles, determining how they'll be engaged, and ensuring that they have adequate capacity to participate effectively are necessary first steps in water governance processes. Now this is a relatively messy diagram, but this comes from my master's work in the Okanagan where I look at social networks. Each one of these circles is a person. The size of the circle ultimately is their relative influence. And right now I'm looking at the water network as it relates to drought here. And this is a formal network. So the, the linkages between these individuals uh, or their ties are these, uh, these lines between the circles. And what I'd like to point out here is that we often hear about governance happening in silos. And I would suggest that this identifies quite clearly that when you actually map out how is it that people are governing water resources, that oftentimes you have a sort of a, a influence center to the network, and then you have a number of people that are working in isolation. It's these kind of network characteristics that I'm interested in generating. And you can see some of the characteristic, um, the density and transitivity and centralization that are listed in the top left-hand corner. And I'm interested in identifying how are some of these network characteristics um, influencers for actual ecosystem outcomes. 
So my, my thesis, my, my question is this. What are the longitudinal associations between water governance network attributes and Okanagan aquatic ecosystem indicators? And one of the interesting things about the Okanagan is that we have both water quality data, but also have some very rich social network data from a group called the Okanagan Basin Water Board, which is also where I work um, in my day job. And I'll have an opportunity to look at 40 years of record to be able to identify where are some of these linkages between network changes and actual ecological outcomes on the ground floor. When we go to the literature, um, this study is largely based on the work of Ostrom and then subsequent to that, Paul Wastel. And here's a very simple but uh, powerful note about how governance regimes ultimately have some influence on performance. But what we also need to be mindful of is the context in which some of these performance measures uh, ultimately manifest. So in my case, I'm going to be looking at a specific lake in the Okanagan. This happens to be Skaha Lake. Uh, for those of you that know the Okanagan at all, it's between Penticton and Oke Falls. Uh, this is one of the uh, amazing beaches on the north end. And this is some data that I was able to collect from the Ministry of Environment. On the bottom, you've got the date on the x-axis. On the y, you have concentration. Uh, and I'm looking at two things. The red line is the total phosphorus levels over time. And you can see that uh, in the late 60s, uh, mid 70s, phosphorus goes up significantly and then it comes back down, um, largely as a result of some interventions of the Okanagan. And you have a lag effect of chlorophyll A, which is quite common for systems like this. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the challenges when trying to match up management intervention and ecological outcomes is effectively this time lag that we see happen often. So if you were to ask the same question but only look at a one year's worth of data, it'd be very, very difficult to be able to get a sense of how is it that some of these governance uh, the treatments have an opportunity to influence um, the ecological outcomes. And so one of the interesting pieces of the work that I'm looking forward to doing over the next few, uh, few months and years uh, is ultimately to be able to match up how is it that the network changes over time and how is it that those network characteristics translate or don't translate into ecological outcomes that we see in the environment. Uh, in terms of methodologically, I'll be using a mixed method framework, um, largely building on uh, Jeremy Pittman and the team that have looked at similar kind of work. Um, this will be the first study that is longitudinal. Uh, there has been some social network ecosystem analysis, but nothing more than three years. Uh, and this will really give us an opportunity to be able to both model um, and also identify the rich narrative behind uh, what is it that occurred in the Okanagan, and what did collaboration look like, and how is it that it translated or manifested into e ecosystem outcomes. And as Paul Wastel notes, any strategy must start from an analysis of the coupled human technology environment system and aim at an improved design of it. So this is effectively where I would like to go with my study. And some of the outcomes that I would like to, uh, to manifest or hopefully emerge as a result of this work is on a societal level, improve our understanding of how water quality may be improved through improving governance processes better understand network power, both formal and informal, uh, and how ultimately that influences the, both um, management outcomes, but also ecological outcomes. And then improving our understanding of uh, multi-level collaboration, polycentricity, good governance, um, and education and communication, and how these things play into good governance. And that's it, thank you very much. For our final presentation, we're maybe looking at governance of a different sort. We just looked at governance of a watershed, but what happens during natural disasters? So for this final presentation, we turn to Paolo Fresnosa. His dissertation is on the normalization of threat and epistemological discourse on indigenous disaster risk management. So from his abstract, the research centers on an epistemological discourse in disaster risk management. Specifically using the lens of the transformative paradigm, this research is going to critique the positivist vis-a-vis -vis constructivist approaches to mitigating naturalist disasters. 
These approaches are certainly evident among the researchers' actors. So this research looks at the indigenous Ivatan and the Philippines government's National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council, and sort of opposes those two different approaches. In particular, climate change exacerbates the latter, that is, the Philippine government's National Disaster Risk Reduction, to employ science and evidence-based tools and technologies for disaster risk reduction. But on the other hand, generations of Ivatans have been practicing ethnometeorology, relying on uh, animal behavior, geophysical observations, and intuitive reactions to prepare for inclement weather. It is where these approaches intersect, so the scientific on one hand and uh, the uh, sort of indigenous ways of knowing on the other, and acknowledge each other's potential for effective disaster risk management that merits this worthy cause for research, and I would agree. Thus, it becomes essential to analyze the ontological and epistemological underpinnings of the positivist and constructivist approaches within this research context. By doing so, Paolo is going to hopefully provide better awareness and a clearer account of what happens during indigenous, or when indigenous and scientific knowledge intersects during national, natural disasters. And I can think of no better time in the world uh, for this type of research. So thank you, Paolo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, your time, for uh, watching, and I hope to get some inputs for you, uh, from you later on. Uh, the title of uh, my presentation today is called Normalization of Threat, an Epistemological Discourse on Indigenous Disaster Risk Management. And let, let me uh, acknowledge first that the term normalization of threat comes from an author, and his name is Greg Bankoff, and he's a leading expert in uh, disaster risk management and cultures in the Philippines. So uh, just a brief overview. Uh, the outline of my presentation is a research context, talking about the problem context, and the proposed methodology, and concluding that afterwards. I'd like to uh, focus on the methodology here uh, for everyone to hopefully, uh, so that I can get some inputs from you and some recommendations. So for the research context, so this is the Philippines, uh, just like over here in my t-shirt. And uh, the one on top there where the marker is, is Batanes. That is the province uh, very, way north, and it's in the middle of the West Philippine Sea and the Pacific Ocean. So it's just the right uh, area where you're going to be brewing the most powerful storms on the planet. So that's Batanes, as I've mentioned. Batanes is also the runway or the direct pathway for the world's strongest typhoons and storms and hurricanes, you name it. Uh, it they have a minimum or average of 20, 200 plus kilometer an hour winds or hurricanes each year. So that's quite a significant number. And in September 13, 2016, which was just two years ago, this happened. They are in the center of the storm, the eye of the storm. And uh, what's quite interesting about that, this is normal for them. And check this out. Washington Post said, remember the island in the super typhoon eye? Not a single person died, reports say. Now, people there attribute the indigenous knowledge and the ways they've been doing this for thousands of years as the reason why they do survive. However, uh, four years ago, actually five years ago, there was a strong, uh, there was a strong storm around the same uh, strength as this one that unfortunately 6,500 souls passed away. So. Anyway, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the players in my report. This is, uh, these uh, indigenous peoples are called the Ibatan of Batanes. Uh, their ethnic identity is largely influenced by the harsh climate. So many elements surrounding the themes of adaption and resiliency can be observed. Language, culture, ways of life, farming, urban planning, everything surrounds this. They practice what you call ethnometriology, and I'd like to put quotations in that because it's not actually considered a formal science yet. So they do practice a lot of these very, very interesting non-scientific, uh, for us, the Western uh, thought of science, uh, nothing like that there. So, and the next player would be the uh, Philippine government, which is the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council, or NDRRMC. They did create this plan. And again, these uh, folks are more of the, uh, the very highly scientific, uh, causal, and very um, uh, related to 
uh, to the sciences of, uh, of predicting and managing natural disasters. So what is the problem? So the problem context is here. Uh, when I did some uh, back-end research, uh, I discovered here that the policies saliently are, are saliently exclusive to just pure technological capacities. So they said their action is we're going to integrate uh, you know, uh, metri uh, sciences and uh, we're going to look at uh, satellite modeling and all these things. Uh, the indigenous knowledge mentioned is quite implicit and pretentious in the entire plan itself and even in the law. Uh, this is the only uh, paragraph that I found out of 98, or, yeah, 98 pages in the whole plan that recognizes indigenous acknowledgement. So for me, that uh, rings a bell saying that, hey, this is not inclusive uh, and there is implicit mention only. So here's my research question a.k.a. question number five. Uh, <laughs> yeah, today. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, how could the NDRRMC approach impact, uh, how does this NDRMC approach impact the Ivatan's traditional ways of managing disaster risk? Okay, so we're going to look at uh, the impacts and how they would be able to create that influence. So the answer can shed light on the significance and magnitude of the changes to indigenous DRM. So I'm going to look into this in a quantitative light. And uh, the question is also looking at the problem context. And the problem context can allow an, or opens up a critical analytical means to derive knowledge. As I've said earlier, the, there seems to be uh, an, an, an exclusive uh, aspect of just the, uh, the positivist construct uh, for uh, DRRMC's plans. So for the proposed methodology, uh, so I'm, I plan to uh, look into the mixed methods since uh, it answers the transformative paradigm, which I plan to also uh, look and inculcate in this project. So the transformative paradigm espouses mixed methods. So in addressing possible power balance issues as well. So for the qualitative uh, method, I plan to use uh, action research. And for the quantitative uh, methods, I plan to use what you call bivariate or multivariate data analysis. So looking at uh, relationships and magnitudes and uh, how uh, one can potentially influence another. And uh, for the action research, starting with just the qualitative, uh, it will look into having some certain research designs such as you know, the traditional in-depth interviews and uh, focus group discussions, mix of interview styles. So I'm going to look into either a semi-structured or unstructured uh, process. And how I'm going to do that is I plan to still, I, I actually plan to stay there for four months. And of course, you can't just show up and say, hey, I'm gonna you know, do research. I actually plan to spend at least a month just creating rapport and creating relationships because in their culture and in our culture, that's how it should be and that's how it's go it goes. So uh, for this, that's why I have yet to determine whether it's going to be semi-structured or unstructured. Uh, but of course, I know that it must be intuitive. So it's going to be dependent on the local context, sentiment, and preferences. And I'm also still looking for other concepts in mind. So if you have any ideas that you may have experienced or have done this before, I'm super open for uh, comments about that. I also uh, see this, uh, see these other uh, ways as, uh, or as what I call inspirations for gathering data. So in action research, it's really about connecting with the locals and having them uh, to take part. So here's an example from Candy Chang, Before I Die. Um, a, it's pretty much a blackboard where I can just post a question and maybe the people in the community can write. So maybe post a question about what is your critique about this, and then they can write something about that. But of course, I don't know if that's feasible because of the strong storms might just fly away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's also here, for example, a confession booth, which is really cool. So it keep thing, keeps things uh, private, so they don't need to be explicit. And also something like this, which I think it's really awesome. 
So showing uh, maybe, for example, a, a photo box or something like that where you can just post a question and they can write something like that and they can maybe be proud about their comments or what they think of. So these are uh, creative ways in gathering data. It sounds mundane and simple, but hey, it can actually come out with something quite significant. And for the quantitative uh, analysis, I have to admit I'm not a pro in numbers, but I believe that this is the right thing to do. And for the robustness of the research, I think that this is, there's potential for this. Uh, the general goal is to identify levels of variability uh, or relationships that will support or disprove the results of the qualitative research. So this one is basically dovetailing the other. So hopefully the quantitative methods will help and support what the outcomes are from the qualitative methods. Specifically, approach will depend on the research question, and I plan to also use ANOVA and multiple regression modeling uh, just to see uh, the maybe uh, causalities or linkages or influences uh, between the, question, uh, the interview questions. And for the conclusion, uh, very quickly, so the dissertation is about positive positivist versus constructivist discourse. Uh, the qualitative and quantitative methods will be used to support and validate each other. And uh, so the mixed methods to use are action research and bi, bi or multivariate data analyses. And the research will uh, be, or will continuously be iterative. So again, uh, with the consulta consultation with the community, I have to uh, look into validating again and again. So it's a circular process and hopefully uh, find myself uh, creating what you call data saturation. So I know that this is the actual uh, data that everyone is actually agreeing upon. And Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.